Good evening, everybody. And dear Dhamma friends, and I'm very happy to have come here and then uh, to give a talk on this uh, topic, which not many people talk about. And I hope that uh, I will leave you with some insights about uh, this particular topic and then uh, open up for a a Q&A at the end, as a plan. So, I um, wanted to thank BGF, Buddhist Gem Fellowship, for all the comedy members, especially uh, Brother Bob and Brother Chi, I don't know other people a lot. Uh, everybody who worked to make this event a success, and then as uh, Bobby said, it was my schedule that made you to make it on Sunday. <laughs> so. Uh, Thank you for considering that way. So let's get started by paying respect to the Buddha. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Namo tasse bhagavato arehato. Asang bundhasse. Namo se bhagavato arehato samma sang buddhasse namo tasse bhagavato arehato samma sang buddhasse right Right. So um, today's topic is going to be on mindfulness, but not the things that uh, you normally hear from uh, the Dhamma speakers a lot. So um, it is not a problem with mindfulness, it is a problem with how the practice is to be practiced by anybody. So I wanted to see whether whether mindfulness makes us more selfish. Not the textual mindfulness, the mindfulness in the contemporary practice, which we know. Right? So as I put a picture over here, choose wisely. Selfishness and selflessness. We cannot just choose one or the other, because we have to see the larger, broad, broader picture of the practice of mindfulness. All right. First of all, I wanted to make a disclaimer, <laughs> just to make yourself uh, comfortable with what you already know about the topic. Ah, before that, let me ask you a question. What does mindfulness mean to you? Otherwise, this is going to be really invalid to proceed. What is mindfulness? Uh, let's talk about the Pali word. Sati, S-A-T-I. Huh? Remembrance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awareness. Focus. Attention. But there's a different Pali word for attention. Manasikara. That is attention. Concentration means samadhi, the next level after sati. Sati after some, the result of sati is samadhi. Other words, other translations that you know? Yes. Uh, being aware of the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is the Western mindfulness uh, interpretation. Western mindfulness says that being non being non judgmental at in the present moment and staying that moment that is Western way of looking at it started by the Joan Kabat Singh, but we're looking at sati, fundamentally sati from the early Buddhist texts. Did somebody say something else? All right, so awareness, attention, focus. Somebody said remembrance. 
Pardon me? Recognition? Recollection, that is Anusati. It's not Sati, Anusati. These are different Pali words. Buddha Anusati, Dhamma Anusati. You look, you're looking at the Buddha through the qualities, uh, nine great qualities. Dhamma Anusati, you're looking at the Dhamma doctrine, looking at um, the six great qualities of the Dhamma. Sangha Anusati, you're looking at the Sangha based on the nine great qualities. Marana Anusati, you're looking at the Marana based on how Marana happens, yes. Persistence, oh, that, that, that leads to a contextual meaning, mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. A lot of words coming up now, <laughs> introspection. Uh -huh. Introspection seems to be pachavekkana. Pachavekkana, like we are supposed to practice pachavekkana. Now, when I mean, a monk is to eat food, he has to practice about, we call it, Pati Sankha Yoniso Pindapadam. We call this as Pachavekkana. Uh, retrospection, introspection, kind of stuff. So Sati basically means presence of the mind. It may be immoral or moral. That's the thing. Because in the Abhidhamma, it says whenever anyone is passing through any Chittas, whatever the chittas, there are seven chetasikas, mental factors, that simultaneously arise with any thought. Let's say somebody is going to kill someone, there is sati also. Somebody is going to do a dana, there is sati also. Right? So sati is a factor that is present in all the activities. I would say kind of an automatic, natural thing. But not samma sati. Uh, samma sati has to be practiced and then come to that level and then to be on it. Right mindfulness. I would say mindfulness is everywhere, but right mindfulness is hardly anywhere. Sati is everywhere, but samma sati is hardly anywhere. Then mitcha sati and sati, we could take both of them together. So sati basically, I would say, Presence of the mind at the moment. Uh, if we go for a literal translation, we might get wrong. So, let's keep it as the presence of the mind. Alright. A disclaimer, just to tell you that this is the focus. The talk makes no attempt to argue that mindfulness, I would say, presence of the mind, I put it at mindfulness because everybody knows this term as mindfulness, is negative. It's a good, pra it's a very essential practice. It is an essential practice. However, the direction and purpose of this practice have been misdirected and misapplied, leading to another selfish journey. Uh, that is where we're going to trace out the issue over here. In this talk, I would like to show how the Buddha's approach to mindfulness sati is a mix of self and other centered approaches. As a result, no meditator can solely focus on oneself in order to grow in the practice of mindfulness in Buddhist teachings. The Satipatthana Sutta is proof. You might not understand this at this point. As I explained to you, you will get what will be discussed. Any difficult things to understand here? The practice of mindfulness has been misdirected, misapplied. Okay, things to remember. And another thing that I try to show you is that mindfulness practice is a practice of both oneself and then others. For a lot of people, it's only a self-centered practice. But according to the Satipatthana Suttas, both Satipatthana Suttas, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta in the Diga Nikaya and Satipatthana Sutta, the condensed version of Satipatthana Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, they all carry these two perspectives. If you want to grow in your Sati practice, you should focus on oneself and the others. So there is a nature, background thing that we can apply to this understanding. The Buddha says that 
why we should not do bad things. We have to set an example to us. Just as we like ourselves, other people also like other people, other beings. In the same way, spiritual practice, Dhamma journey is interconnected between oneself and the other people. This is just a background proof. All right, this is what I'm going to be talking. Does Buddhism teach individuals to be selfish? Conventional truth, that means samma, uh, samuti satcha, context of atta. Samuti satcha. What is samuti satcha? Uh, I will explain to you. Ultimate truth, paramatta satcha, context of atta self. Taking care of self as conventional truth. Is practicing sati selfish or selfless? That is what we are exactly focusing on. Primary goals, secondary goals, areas of focus are Dhamma journey. Overall Dhamma journey involves self-care and other care. Satipatthanas include others as objects of practice. Finally, a plan for a better selfless mindfulness pra uh, meditation practice. Right, starting with whether Buddha's teachings teach us to be selfish. What do you think? Huh? No. Is it an imagination? No, you just think that it should be so. Buddhism asks everyone to be unselfish while wisely fostering the Atta self. The Pali word for oneself is Atta. A double T A. That's the Pali word. Atta means self in Buddhism and it has to be understood in two ways. I would call it two context. In other words, two truths. The first is the conventional context Atta exists, whereas the second is the ultimate context Atta does not exist. Unfortunately, people always catch the second one. There's no other five aggregates, 12 bases, 18 elements. That is what they pick on right away. But that's a wrong approach. If Atta does not exist, who do we call as the mother? Who is having the pain? If your knees are aching, who is having that pain? You could call your mom, oh, just a bunch of five aggregates. Right? Is that the way that you call? How you should uh, get along with these people? No. So we understand Atta exists, but at the conventional level, Sammuti Satcha. Not at the Paramatta Satcha. Paramatta Satcha, yes, nobody exists. But most of the people think it is only the Paramatta Satcha, ultimate truth, that we have to consider to understand everything. It is not. Maybe you haven't understood this point. Let me explain to you again. In Buddhism, if you want to understand anything, you have to use all those things into two truths. Samuti Satcha, conventional truth, and then the ultimate truth called Paramatta Satcha. Samuti Satcha means uh, people, animals, events, anything that you see buildings, technology, right? computers. Now I call this a laptop. But according to Paramatta Satcha, this is not a laptop. Right? This is a bunch of, uh, this is an amalgamation of bunch of, I would say, eight, eight elements. Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayo, Vanna, Gandha, Rasa, Oja, Abhidhamma, Pure Octad. They say eight very uh, nuclear level of elements. But I don't take it that way now. Laptop. right? I take it as the Samuti Satcha. But if I want to see the reality of this laptop, maybe later today, I will see it as this is a bunch of elements. right? Now you know main four elements. Huh? Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayu. Right? What is Patavi? Solidity. Yeah? The solid. Apo this has water, right? When this is burnt, this can be melted and something can pour. 
watery element can exist. Does, it, does this have a tejo? Yes, when this is overused, then th definitely there is some heat coming up. Even that can happen by the end of this talk, because there is no room for the air, <laughs> right? And then vayu, is there something that is going through inside the circuits, hardware, software stuff? Yeah, a lot of things happening. That is why we can use this. And then vanna gandha rasoja. Vanna means there is a certain texture over here. Then rasa, there is a certain rasa, sentiment. I would say a flavor. Nobody is going to eat this. But if it is, uh, if it is uh, going to be eaten by animal or somebody, there is a taste. Then gandha, there is a smell. Then there is oja. That means there is some nutriment for anybody who mistakenly consume this one. So, in that way, what we try to need, what we need to understand is that everything can be seen in two ways: samuti satcha, paramatta satcha. Right? That is what we have to understand. Even atta. Now we know in Buddhism there is a radical claim. It's a very radical claim. Nobody thinks it's radical. Now in the Western societies, they say Buddhism is very, you know, not rigid, it's a fundamental, no good claims. But what if you think about that Buddha says there is no self? It's a radical claim. Because everything is based on self there. The enlightenment movements and everything. Especially all the Eastern philosophies, Hinduism, Upanishad, Aranikas, Vedantas, Yogas, everything, and Buddhism. Jainism, they are fundamentally rooted in looking at one's own self. And Buddha says that self exists at the conventional level, but not at the ultimate level. Hinduism said, no, the self is eternal. When you die, you carry yourself with the self. They said soul, actually. Like a leech. When the leech is trying to uh, get off from one thing to the other thing, it's like the person. Buddha said, no. Yes, something is going, departing from yourself, but it is always changing. If it is always changing, then you can't say it is a permanent entity. Right? So, you can see the Buddha says, anatta. Anatta means you cannot take you as self. At the con uh, some uh, paramatta such. But in the Dhammapada, Dhammapada has a Vagga chapter called 12th chapter, it is called Atta Vagga. There Buddha says, Atta exists. Does this computer have internet? Should have, huh? Try to go see uh, Dhammapada's 12 chapters, huh? Right? Yeah, so Dampada, you go to the twelfth, twelfth chapter, the self, see? Uh, click on that. See, all these verses are talking about how to take care of yourself. Let's take a couple of them. If one, uh, the first one, 157, if one holds oneself dear, one should diligently watch oneself. Let the wise man keep vigil during any of the three watches of the night. One should first establish oneself in what is proper, then only should one instruct others. Thus the wise man will not be reproached. See? Uh, this is all about oneself, right? Uh, Yes. So, um, if you go down, the, all these verses are about oneself. That means the Buddha asks us to take care of us. Really? Good. In many other sut uh, suttas and stanzas, the Buddha says, Arogya Paramalaba. Arogya Paramalaba means 
health is the best gain. That means we have to take care of us. So you can do this uh, maybe as a homework when you go home one day. No, sorry, today. <laughs> you can see all the verses in the Attavag. Huh? Go back to our uh, discussion. So Atta exists. Huh? Atta exists at the conventional level, but not at the ultimate level. All right. Conventional truth again, Samuti Satcha about Atta self. Why I, why I discuss about self here, Atta? It is because I want to show you that uh, the Buddha asks us to work on ourselves. Because this might be an extension of the, the practice of mindfulness in a selfish way. That is why I talk about the Atta a little bit. Self exists in the context of conventional truth. The Buddha advised us to look after ourselves, both physically and mentally. Did the Buddha say so? Did he ask us to take care of us? Anywhere in the suttas? Did he ask us to take care, eat well, sleep well, any exercises? Where did he say so? Did he ask us to take care of our body? And the mind? Mind definitely. But the body? How has he explained that? Let's talk about the food. There is a very interesting sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya where King Kosala came to see the Buddha. And then he was very uncomfortable. Then Buddha asked, what's wrong with you? And he said, today I ate a lot of food. So I have the Bhatta Sammada. Bhatta Sammada means uh, intoxication made by the rice. Now, a lot of people think Surameria means only alcohol. It's not only alcohol. It, it goes beyond the, f I would say, alcohol, fermentation. Right? So when you eat a couple of plates of rice, you will become intoxicated. You feel sleepy. You should not drive. Right? Yes, it is Surameria. So Ramere does not mean alcohol, because we consume alcohol, why not? If you catch a cough, the doctor will give you a prescription, like a codeine-based syrup. And he says, do not take it during the day. Take it at night, just before you sleep, because you will feel drowsy. If it, is drow if it makes us drowsy, that means alcohol. So we've been having lots of alcohol that way. It's not alcohol. Alcohol is one of the things that people can get easily intoxicated. But there are many other things. This fermentation can happen from many ways. I would say uh, flour-based stuff, rice-based stuff, a lot of things. Just, just imagine, look at your personal life, how you can get intoxicated. Uh, it, could be, it could go beyond the drinks. Uh, if, if you look at your daily uh, food intake, you would see. So King Kosala was very uncomfortable. Then uh, he was embarrassed, and then the Buddha said, OK, I'll tell you. A, way how to overcome this issue. It's good for all of us. Chattaro pancha alope abutva udakam pive. The king leaves some four to five morsels in your stomach. Do not fill the whole tummy with the food. Right? Because at that time in India they had a thought when you eat, you have to fill your tummy. That, that was a misconception. The Buddha says, do not fill it with rice, food. Just leave some four to five morsels, mouthfuls of food. In that case, rice or wheat flour. For that remainder, the remainder of four to five morsels, drink water. Chattaro pancha alopi abutva. Having not eaten four to five morsels, Udakam pive. Udakam means water. Drink water. Alang pasu viharaya pahitattasa bhikkhuna. When you are comfortable with your food that would digest in your body, your spiritual journey becomes intensified, faster. You have a smooth processing of your spiritual journey. Just because you learn Dhamma and then practice meditation, you won't do well. Food affects. Right? The way how you Take the food, affect. 
Buddha was not concerned about what food you eat, but he was concerned about how much you eat. Moderation. There's a Pali word in Dhammapada, Bojanecha Matanyuta. Bojana means food. Matan, Matta means dosage, the limit, boundary. Nyuta, you are conscious about the level of food. Some people might be intoxicated by eating on only one plate of rice. Some people take four to five plates of rice or something like that. So each one's intoxication level varies. So you should know by yourself. Anyways, so Buddha asked us to take care of us. He said this body is going to uh, br uh, break up one day and they will be uh, integrated back to the recycling process. Our last breath will go to the air. Our bodily parts will go back to the recycling process. Right? The uh, consciousness will go to another body, depending on your karmas, by being changed. But, he said, if that is the ultimate truth, but there is the conventional truth, you should take care of yourself. The person who is struggling a lot with sicknesses cannot easily practice Dhamma. I can't sit down, I have a back problem, I have this and that. Very difficult. Some people are having these issues. But, uh, it can be a kind of a barrier for them, you know. Could be a problem. While we are accepting uh, sicknesses are common to all of us, but when you have sicknesses, your Dharma journey will become a little bit of a burden to you. Not that easy. So we try to take care of us. Not, uh, you can see, not, I would say here, fostering, not fostering a very strong attachment to the body. You take good food, you eat good food, you sleep well, huh? you sleep well. They are very necessary for your Dhamma practice. Right? So, that means Buddha really asks us to take care of, uh, you know, us personally. The Buddha stated that Atta cannot exist when viewed from a broader perspective. Yeah, that is Paramatta Satya. That is what a lot of people pick up very easily. Life is boring, suffering, you know, we gotta, you know, do good karma, we know we don't know when we're gonna die. Right? Of course we're gonna die when we learn Dhamma or not. Right? But where is that moderative understanding between Samudhi Satcha and Paramatta Satcha? Here, Atta does not exist because we cannot take us carrying a self but as a composite of five aggregates. So what we have is five aggregates. We all have five aggregates, living beings. What are they? What are the five aggregates, dumb folks? Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyana. What is Rupa? Form. We have a. Okay. Then Vedana? Feelings. Sanya? Perception. Sankara? Formations. Huh? Then Vinyana? Consciousness. Now the problem is not we having five aggregates. The problem is that we are clinging to five aggregates, making the five aggregates become upadanas. That is the issue. Then it will become not rupa khanda, it will become rupa upadana khanda. Then vedana khanda is okay, but when you cling to your vedana, your feelings, it will become vedana upadana khanda. That is why in the Dhamma Chakapatana Sutta, Buddha said clearly, if, like, maybe he thought that the five ascetics did not understand the abstract well. He said, all right, if you don't understand, Sankitena, in brief, I would tell you, Panchupadana kanda dukkha, which is birth, decay, aging, uh, 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 association with the people who you don't like, separation from the loved ones, uh, you are expecting something, but it's not going to happen, and it's, it's kind of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. All these are separately taken as dukkha. But if you don't understand that part, you think all those dukkha start from creating, forming a clinging towards your panchakkan. That is why dukkha start. So, aggregates are okay, but then the problem is when you form clinging to aggregates. Still, we haven't come to our topic. Huh? I'm trying to make the background. However, this technique of perceiving the truth should not be misconstrued for the sole way for seeing the truth. I think I, I sort of mentioned to you, whenever you want to see life, 
your experience, what is happening to other people, what is happening to you. Always try to look at any phenomena, any phenomenon through the both truths, Samuti and Paramat. Taking care of self as conventional truth, which I already explained to you. All right, now we come down to the topic. Is practicing mindfulness or sati selfish or selfless? It's common to believe that any Buddhist practice begins with self-practice. Is it so? Yes. Now, how did the self-practice start in India? The Brahmanism existed before 1,500 years before the Buddha's time. And then what happened? People didn't like that there is a God who creates everything. Then they thought, no, our liberation is not with a God. Our liberation is trying to find our liberation within us. So they started some rigorous practices. Some people, they give a lot of pain to the body. They didn't eat for many years, like what the Prince Siddhartha did. Some people um, didn't take showers for many years. Right? Gave a lot of pain to the body. Right? Giving a lot of pain. The Buddha said, you will never find happiness by giving pain to your body. He said, the happiness that I'm talking, what he called Majjhima Patipada, Noble Eightfold Path, will only be found by a certain other happiness, not giving pain to your body. When you give pain to your body, you will get ended up with a lot of anger, frustration, uh, those kind of stuff. He said to the Jains at that time. So anyways, our Dhamma journey usually start from a self-practice. That means you maybe you listen to some Dhamma talks, you read books, uh, you come to a, temp a centre like this, you go to a Vihara, and you sort of try to find out where you can position yourself. However, the Buddha was aware of the problem of merely focusing on oneself in the self-practice. That is an issue, because this is the first issue that we have to overcome just before we attaining our bare minimum spiritual attainment. What's the bare minimum attainment that we, we are supposed to aim for? Sotapatti. What is Sotapatti? Sotapatti means en entering the stream. We have to, have to enter the stream. But this stream is a little different stream. It's not downstream. It is upstream. Patisot. <laughs> It goes, it goes against the current, like not, not like believing what other people speak, like go to the flow, right? It is going upward. Everybody goes down, downward, you know. Just join in the flow, join in the conversation. Ah, okay, okay, I'll do the same, okay, okay, let's do it again, right? So, then, in order you need to become a Sotapanna, you have to first uh, work on one very important thing. That is called as Sakkaya Ditti. What is Sakkaya Ditti? Personalizing your five aggregates. Eh? Creating identity. Of course, you need to have an identity in your Samudhi Satcha. But according to the Paramatta Satcha, you cannot create, you should not create identity. Alright? So, that is really related to the personality issue. That means, if you are so much attached to your self-practice that might create some kind of a self-centered, I would say an excessive level of selfishness, self-centeredness in your practice. You never know that unless you are under a certain teacher. That's why this Dhamma practice cannot be done without a teacher. Teacher is a must, a good teacher. Maybe a monastic teacher is a good one, right? Okay, some might think, okay, I'm going to watch a couple of YouTube videos. Tomorrow my plan is to become a Sotapan. And I go to a couple of retreats. I know everything. I talk to them. Now, this is the way. It won't work. It won't work. How many people end up like that? Because they do not follow the process. Right? So, self-practice has to be done carefully under a good teacher. As a result, he, the Buddha taught mindfulness practice not only as a self-practice, but also at each satipattana exercise to observe how the particular exercise works for others. This is very interesting. How many exercises do we have in the satipattana 
uh, practice. How many satipatthanas are there? Four satipatthanas. Right? Four satipatthanas. Then what are they? Kayanupasana. That means practicing mindfulness, your sati, based on your bodily changes, whatever the ha things happening in, inside the body or maybe outside the body. Then Vedana Anupasana means your feelings. Then Chitta Anupasana means your different thoughts. There are 16 thoughts that the Buddha talks about. Saraga, Sadhusa, Samoha, Savitaka, Vitaka, Mahagata, Amahagata, the list goes on and on. Dhamma Anupasana, you are going to be mindful looking at the, uh, I would say, Dhamma properties, mental properties. Panchanivarana, five hindrances, vulnerable truths, seven bodhjangas. So do we have to practice all these satipatthanas to, to attain something? Should we? Good question. Huh? <laughs> Should we? What is your knowledge? What is your understanding about it? Should we have to practice all these satipatthanas, starting from Kaya to Dhamma? Yes? Really? Okay, if you, if you want to learn satipatta, yeah, if you want to learn satipatthana sutta, you can learn. And maybe we're going to practice the four. But in order for you to attain a certain spiritual attainment, even one satipatthana is sufficient. A good news, huh? <laughs> it's a good news. Yes, it depends on the person's sansari consciousness, the, whatever the things inside. Because you don't think that only in this life you are creating a. No, it's a sansaric journey because you are trying, trying to cut this sansaric journey. It's not what you learn in this life. Some people are very much worried. Oh, I could not do a lot of good karmas. I could not do a lot of dana. So I don't know what's going to happen to me. Right? You do your best. But you must have been doing a lot of things in your sansara. Right? So in each satipatthana, the Buddha says that at the end, how you should need to practice it. Have you ever looked at that uh, section? Uh, today I'm going to show you. Before that, I'm going to uh, tell you that we have a certain goal to reach over here. Does mindfulness decrease pro-sociality? This is a psychological word, don't worry. Like Things like noble friendship and kind of those stuff, that kalyana mitata, in those who are more individualistic, selfish. Because Buddha says that kalyana mitata is very important. How important is that? How much is it important? Whole, yeah. So one day Bhante Ananda said that 50%, maybe the half of our Dhamma journey works being in the company of the Kalyanamittas. Who is a Kalyanamitta? Let me ask you. Everybody says ah, we need Kalyanamitta, but who is a Kalyanamitta? Huh? Dhamma friends. We all are Dhamma friends. We all want to support each other. But who is particularly, who is truly a Kalyanamit according to the Buddhist text? Someone who is highest Ah, that one. Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. Now, if I want to look at it in my way, or in your way, there is someone who has more sila than you. Maybe that person surpasses your sila. There's someone who, who surpasses your Sadda, trust in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Someone who surpasses your Chaga, giving away generosity. Someone who surpasses your generosity. That is the Kalyana myth. So are all Dhamma friends like that? I don't think so. This is a very personal journey, so we have to understand how we look at them. So, well, I mean, we need Dhamma friends, it's just to you know, do these things. But Kalyanamittas are kind of very specific layer that you need to find. How many Kalyanamittas should we have? Should we need? Do we need uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? What is the minimum number of Kalyanamittas? Because Buddha says in one of the suttas, Kalyanamitta sutti in the Anguttara Nikaya. 
are two kalyana mittas. This is the minimum. Koram, <laughs> the Koram. <laughs> Who are they? The Buddha says that I am the, I am a kalyana mitta to everybody in this world. Yes, because of him we study, we learn, practice, apply. We do everything because of him. Huh? We get the respect because of him. See how many things he must have done in his previous lives to get to that level. How many people offer Buddha puja to him every day? How much food? Right? So, Shakyamuni Samma Sambuddha, Samma Sambuddha is the first Kalyanamitta to all of us. Then second one, who is the second Kalyanamitta? Ah, that one we have to find. <laughs> one that, as we discussed, someone who has more Sadda, more Sila. Sadda means uh, trust about the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Sila means uh, more, I would say, virtues than yourself. And someone who is more generous than you. Someone who is, who is wiser than you. Actually, remember when uh, one couple uh, approached the Buddha, Nakula Mata, Nakula Pita. They said to the Buddha, Bhante, now Nakula Pita, the male, he says, we have been married for over 60 years now. Very interesting story. Uh, and then uh, he said to the Buddha, ever since I married this woman, lady, I haven't even thought about any other woman. Huh? And then uh, Nakula Mata also said the same thing. Ever since I married him, I haven't even thought about any other man. Right? So, our wish is, we want to be reborn together in the next life. Is it possible? Buddha said, yes. Did he say, no, no, Anicca, don't take a risk. Don't take a chance, don't go to next life. No. He acted accordingly. He said, yes, but on four grounds. What are the four grounds? If both of you have equal sadda, again the four, the list. Equal sadda means equal trust. That trust is not the Buddha Dhamma Sangha trust. That trust is between yourself. If you have a very good communication, if you know each other very well, uh, if you have minimized a lot of misunderstandings, yes, have equal. Because in today's world, uh, one of them is getting suspicious and then so much overthinking about stuff, maybe all protecting, right? So if you have equal sadda, sama sadda, if you have equal morality, both are very moral. They are not trying to uh, cross the boundaries. Samasila. Then Samachaga, both are very generous. In some relationship, uh, one is very generous, but the other is not. You don't give that much, you know. That donation is too much. <laughs> but, but in this context, no. Both are equally okay. Let's do it. They are able to agree upon that kind of thinking. And then wisdom, they both are wise. So mutual, uh, not mutual, I would say uh, equal wisdom. That wisdom is not the wisdom that we see in Buddhism, higher wisdom, but at least they think more than intellect, knowledge, intellect and wisdom. So the Buddha said it's possible. Right? So I wanted to say that noble friendship and those kind of stuff, they are pro-social stuff. So whether if you are more s centered on your practice, does it impair your I would say Kalyanamitta practice and etc. etc. That is a concern. Second, can being more aware of how connected individuals are to each other help Kalyanamittas prevent a decrease in pro sociality, like things like noble friendship? Okay, so the opposite side. Okay, these are some of the claims that Westerners, Western psychologists make. Mindfulness training may increase selfishness by making those who prioritize me-centric independence over we-centric interdependence less likely to exhibit pro-social behavior. Exaggerated claims about the potential benefits of mindful practice. Do you think that there are some ex exaggerated benefits? No, actually, everybody promotes mindfulness. Now it has become a business in certain ways. But anyways, it's a good practice. There may be some extremes. Mindfulness is a tool, not a prescription which requires more than a plug-and-play approach if practitioners are to avoid its potential pitfalls. I would say, I would add, 
not mindfulness. I would say selfish level of practicing mindfulness, not mindfulness. They put a premium on individualism while downplaying the value of collectivism. Actually, the collectivism, noble friendship, uh, things we do with other people, other kalyanamittas are to happen, then it's okay, but it's not in some places. Encouraging people to think more about their interdependence. When you are with kalyanamittas, you are interdepending on each other to, to know things, to get some uh, comments about your practice. So you feel good about it. You know? Not like you stay in one room, isolated. You are a lonely practitioner. You know? uh, right. Before practicing mindfulness might help to avoid a decrease in pro-social behavior among those with a more individualistic well, These are Western claims. All right. Now I'm going to show you the answer here. According to the Sutta text, the Buddha explici explicitly said that the need for others in our Dhamma journey is essential. In that example, Buddha said, Kalyanamittas makes the full journey, full Dhamma journey. Because we may be self-motivated, right? I wanted to go to temple, I wanted to read Dhamma books, listen, but that is not enough. For example, if you sit with 10 people to meditate, and if you sit alone, what would easily uh, get you into the practice? That collectivism can help you while you're doing your own meditation. As a result, understanding that we can only work on our Dhamma path with ourselves through meditation is a mistake. The assistance of other Dhamma friends is essential. I highly emphasize Kalyanamitta. Other support for our Dhamma path comes from a variety of sources. I have listed some of them. These are directly helpful in deepening our Dhamma journey. One is Kalyana Mittata. Second, listening to Dhamma. Some people wrongly understand. We don't want to listen to Dhamma talks. We just only meditate. Can you separate these two? How many people attain Nibbana by listening to the Dhamma talk while the Buddha was giving the Dhamma talk? Because it depends on everybody. When Buddha was giving the Dhamma talk, they start thinking, oh, my life, I'm connecting what, to what he says to me. So then there are insights arising. That is a very direct approach. Well, some people took a lot of time, like a meditator. It, it, it worked for them that way. There are so many ways to attain. There are not only one way. So Dhamma Savana, Saddhamma Savana is a very good one. Then Suacho, opening up for teachers. We know that we are asked to open up for a teacher. Maybe someone who knows, someone who can correct us. Right? Suacho, where is it mentioned? Suacho? Can you remember? Ah, Metta Sutta. Sakko Uju Cha Suju Cha Suacho Cha Samudya. Suacho means being able to open up for someone who can give us a guidance. Some people are not that open. They are very disobedient. They think that what they think is right. That is where they ruin the problem. Whenever you come over here thinking that I know everything, you will not learn anything. You go to a class anywhere, maybe a spiritual, non-spiritual thing. I know everything, I just go and see what's going on. You will never learn anything. You have to unlearn, then you will learn. Like that Japanese Zen story, like, you know, a professor went to a Zen master's uh, uh, temple and the Zen master knew that, Professor, maybe we learn a lot, you know. <laughs> so he said, can I make some tea? He said, yes, okay. And he made a tea. And then now he uh, placed his cup and then now he started pouring the tea. He said, now he's pouring but the cup is overflowing. He said, stop, you know, you see. Uh, that's like your, that's like you. You have to unlearn to learn Dhamma. Because you have to unlearn. So that means we have to be able to open up for the right person, not to the wrong person, okay? Don't open up for the wrong person. That will be the other end. Then helping others. Is it important? Like volunteering, go to the temple, go to another center, maybe food drive, blood donation, maybe, I think so many things happening over here too, right? It's very important for yourself, uh, your Dhamma practice, right? Very important. Some people know oh, that's not very important. I do my, no. They are all connected, interconnected. Then gratefulness, katanyuta, the first thing that Buddha told us, showed us, by looking at the Bodhi tree. We have to be grateful. If you are not grateful, you will never progress in your Dhamma journey. 
grateful to your mother, your father, your roots, your culture. That's such a very important inspiration when you are grateful. Wishing and engaging in others' well-being, attacharya. Always need to say, really, from bottom of heart, may you be well, may you be happy. You have to make that. You have to make it from the bottom of your heart. That really helps us to continue our practice. Ah, this is interesting. Precepts. Why do we take precepts? We actually, the most benefit of the precepts go to the other people. You are not killing, then uh, other people are safe. And you are purifying your mind. You are not stealing, other people's stuff are fundamentally protected. You are purifying your mind. You are not misbehaving, then other people are safe. You are not running into other people's uh, relationships, they are safe, and you are safe too. You are not going to lie, so people are not misinformed. And you are purifying your truthfulness. You are not taking intoxicative stuff, whatever the rice, food, alcohol, excessively then, you are protecting other beings. So the most benefit of the five precepts, or whatever the precepts, go to other people. So then, what does it mean? It's about other people. That's the point here. So up, seal, sealers, fund, now don't think that, ah, is it for other people? Not for me. <laughs> yeah, it's for you too. You are purifying yourself, at the same time you are doing the greatest good for other people. So all these are interconnected to your Dhamma journey. All right, let's go on. One stanza. Atta dattang parathene bahuna pinaha pai. Atta datta mabinyaya sadatta pasutosya. Let one not neglect one's own welfare for the sake of another. However great, clearly understanding one's own welfare, let one be intent upon the good. Buddha says in one other place, Sutta, there are people who are always selfish. Very selfish. Then there are some other people who are very altruistic. They are not even taking a shower, they are not eating properly, they are not sleeping properly, they always think about somebody else. Maybe in a good faith, but only other people. And there are some other people who are both caring oneself and other people. Hardest part. Huh? And there are some other people who are neither thinking about oneself and other people. Buddha said, aim for the third one. That is the good way. So, our whole Dhamma journey involves both self-care and other care. Because it is the motivation for the uh, mindfulness practice. It's not going to be a selfish one. Okay, this is very interesting. Mindfulness should not lead to selfishness. Focus on self-care and other, being, other care. Consequently, how do we understand the Sati practice here? Can we only advance in our sati practice by concerning on ourselves, which many people do. According to the Satipatthana Sutta, Majjhimanikaya 12, all mindfulness practices should be performed by concentrating on oneself and others, on the relevant objects of exercise. This demonstrates how the Buddha advised minimizing, minimizing any self-centered or egotistical, egotistical thoughts when focusing solely on the relevant Satipatthana. Exercise. When one believes that meditation is merely a self-practice, he or she may become selfish at that point. Now let's examine how the Buddha advised that Satipatthana practice of each exercise include observing how others perform the same exercise. Now what is the uh, thought that came to your mind when I say this thing? Now Bhante is saying that when you practice your meditation, you cannot only think about yourself, you may have to think about others. What do you think about it? What was the first thought that came to your mind? Kind of a confusing thought, right? You never heard that kind of a thing. Ah, let's go to the Sutta. Kaya Anupasana. Now, after explaining Kaya Anupasana, there are a lot of Kaya Anupasana practices. What are they? Tell me a couple of them. Tell me some of the couple of uh, Satipatthana uh, Kaya Anupasana practices. Uh, breathing is one. Then, postures, right? Different postures. Then, awareness practices. Then, 32 uh, bodily parts. Then, uh, nine 
charnel grounds, a little bit difficult one today. At uh, that time people died, they just left in the cemetery. Uh, so, and the elements. So do we have to practice all this? No, we don't need. I think uh, you could go for the first tree. Now we take the breath meditation, the breath part. While, now I I'm going to connect it to this one. Now you practice medit uh, breath meditation. How are we supposed to practice breath meditation? In short, are we forced to breathe? What do we do in the breath meditation? A simple question. Uh, we watch our breaths. We watch our breaths. And we become observers initially and then we think that there is no observer. But just the meditation happens. We are not going to separate. Ob there is a meditator and meditation. Finally meditation, meditator become one. That is the purpose. Otherwise you think, ah, I meditated today, two hours, three hours, went for a retreat. Selfishness can rise that much. So we start with your uh, meditating practice, but at the end you think there is no meditator, but was a, only a meditation practice happened today. So now you watch your breaths. How do you watch your breaths? Tell me the way. Ah, when the short breath arises, then you think it is a short breath. Right? So then you breathe in, that short breath. Goes up. Can you focus on two breaths at the same time? That is not advisable. Only one breath at a time. Then let's say now there is a different type of breath, long breath come. Are there only two types of breaths? No, there are half, half breaths too, different breath styles. So we focus on each breaths as they naturally happen. Now this is about us or other people. This is about me and yourself, right? But in the second line of that particular satipattana exercise, each exercise, Buddha says this, thus meditator dwells contemplating the nature of the body, breathing is the nature of the body, in the body in regard to himself, that person, or he dwells contemplating the nature of the body in the body in regard to others. What does it mean? He says, while you are you may focus on your different breaths. Short breaths happen, long breaths happen, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Maybe a mixture of those two happen. At the same time, you're going to watch about other people's breaths. Can, it, can we do it? Is it easy to do? We can't see how they breathe. But what is asked to do here? We have to understand every being is breathing. That's it. Every being is breathing then you are not putting yourself into a very much self's practice. Ah, like me, everybody's, like in the metta meditation. May I be well, happy, peaceful, may no harm come to me, difficulties come to me, no problems come to me, but problems come to us. <laughs> and then, may all living beings be well. Do we know all beings? We don't know who they are, exactly. We know only this earth. Why we go to the all living beings? Because the Buddha knew. If you only do it for yourself, you will end up with lots of selfishness. That is why you had to go to all living beings. In the same way, here, now you've done your breath meditation, now you are looking at breath meditation on your side and onto the other people's side too. Every person breathes in and breathes out. What does it help? It helps us to lower, minimize, I wouldn't say that we can avoid, because we are if you are not unenlightened, these thoughts can come. But at least you know this, this has to be minimized. I had to avoid it. So your self-centeredness will go differently. Uh, this is for one of the exercises in the Kayanapasana. And this applies to all the Kayanapasana ex exercises. When you walk, when you sleep, when you lie down, when you eat, when you not, do not talk. In the practice, in the methodology, you must bring it to other people too. Other people also talk. Other people also eat. Other people also are silent. Right? And then you are looking at it from a broader point of view. Vedana Pasana is the same thing. I feel happiness. I feel unhappiness. I feel the neutrality. Just as how other people, other people also go through these things. Right? So I'm not going to be overwhelmed with my own feelings. 
right? Not mood that much with my own feeling. I understand this is a reality, truth that is going to everybody. Chitta Anupasana, just as I come with a lustful thought about somebody, just as I come with a dosa thought, angry thought, other people also may come with them. So everybody, uh, depending on their level of understanding, level of practice, they may come up, they may uh, overcome it. I come to that point. But if you only think, okay, no, I'm, I'm good, I'm not going to that, I don't think other people are like that. <laughs> they might be ruining their practice, uh, self-centeredness and turn into a selfishness. Dhammanupasana, same. Dhammanupasana means you're looking at how many five hindrances do you have. And you understand? While I'm trying to avoid them, other people are also trying to struggle with them, overcome with them. What are the five hindrances, Dhamma folks? Huh? Well, we'll start from a certain beginning. Kama Chanda, sensual pleasure. Vyapada, ill will. Tinamidda, sloth and torpor. Uddacha Kukucha, restlessness of the mind and remorse, regret of the mind. And then, Vichikicha, doubt. So these are normal things. These are actually, if I want to see this uh, pillar, it's like this. These five are covering myself. I can't see. I could actually uh, keep them away. Otherwise, I see the wrong. It's not the inside. I see things as uh, we are, not I see things as they are. The vipassana is going away. I get to a non vipassana state of mind. So, now here, when you are going through five hindrances, you know whether you are good at overcoming them, whether you are bad at, maybe you are not good at, them. and you see other people are also going through the same journey. So you understand, this is a very universal journey. I should not create any selfishness while thinking I am also one of them and continue my path as much as possible. That is why I said, if you do not understand this, your sati practice will become selfish. Make sense? All right. And then, a plan for a better selfless mindfulness uh, meditation practice, understanding your self-practice. Actually, we say that you have to start with yourself. Yes, that's true. Buddhist self-practice is not a self-centered practice. When you practice, as you practice, you know, no, it, it has to go toward other people too. Uh, un understanding what they do, not that you go and, uh, uh, do you breathe now? <laughs> not like that. You understand that they are also going through the same emotions, feelings, and all, so and so forth. Overcoming self-centered misperceptions within your mindfulness practice. So, find out whether you are creating selfishness in your practice. You can feel it. Blending your mindfulness practice as a combined effort of doing self-care and other care. If you are somebody who is really concerned about you and other people, this is, li this is not a problem. So, you are I think, doing well. But if you do not know that Satipatthana Sutta encourages you to have uh, relate every Satipatthana practice to others too, that is a serious mistake in your practice. Finally, getting the help from Kalyana Mithas to proceed. Maintain and deepen the mindfulness practice. That is how we are going to uh, understand and then practice. Alright, uh, now we are going to open up for a Q&A session, if you have. Alright. Anybody has any question? Maybe they can give the mic to them. Any questions about uh, this topic or mindfulness in general? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, good evening, Bande. Good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you, you so much for the Dhamma sharing. A lot of uh, great uh, relevant Sutta references. So uh, I've got a few questions. Mm, uh, so for the Sati Patana Sutta, my first question is, uh, I guess uh, my, my first question is an, a question of translation. Mm -hmm. 
if I understand it correctly, uh, please correct me if I if I recall it wrongly. If I understand it correctly, the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, the part where the Buddha gives the instruction about contemplating, you know, the, the four foundations. What you're translating as re in regard to oneself and in regard to others, sometimes I see the translation, they translate it as something like internally and externally. Is that right? Yes. Ajatta bahit. Ajatta means internally. That is where people don't know. Uh, bahit means others. So that means that particular exercise, Satipanda exercise, has to be done internally by oneself. Actually, this is what all of you doing, everybody. And then externally too. Externally means looking at how other people experience that particular phenomenon. I uh, normally see. people say externally. Yeah? What is externally? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> There's no <laughs> interpretation about it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And then why the man passiva? Then looking at the changes of that phenomenon after that. They do it. Everybody does it, that part. But they skip that uh, bahidda part. Mm. Right, right. Because, yeah, it, uh, if, if, if we are looking at the translation internally and externally, it might not be too uh, obvious or too clear mm -hmm. that it means you know, the reference to oneself and others, right? Yeah, uh, externally definitely means others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> my, my second question is, my second question is a question of practice. Mm -hmm. So when, when, we, when we talk about the four applications of mindfulness and we, and we go through the instructions, especially when we're doing our meditation, right? Uh, mindfulness of the body and then mindfulness of feelings. It is, um, you might say, it is easier to, to observe what's going on within yourself. But if, if externally refers to other people, it, it seems like a, a much more difficult practice. I mean, if I'm going to be observing the feelings in other people, it's, it's much more difficult to know what they're feeling, for example. Um, are there maybe a grad, is there maybe a gradual sort of gradual process of beginning to observe that feeling? Maybe in the beginning, I don't know, you, you'll be talking to them or having a conversation with them and then, I, I don't know, like, yeah. As I said uh, <clears throat> under that, I said we cannot observe uh, all these feelings or all these practices. What we need to have is a general understanding, just as me, just as I go through my lustful thoughts, just as I go through my happy feelings, other people also may experience the same. That's it. We don't know what time, when, uh, WH questions. Just a general knowledge. Because uh, that is too trespassing uh, into their life. If you're going to say, what feeling are you having now? <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> Just thinking the same thing, like when you are going through pain. Uh, pain. And then, yes, this pain is a common pain. When somebody passes away, when something happens uh, that doesn't work, then common thing. One day somebody will go through the same, one day. It's a common thing, universal thing, that to understand. Not that you're going to track everybody, ah, what is your feeling, what is your thought, what is your progress of the five hindrance, no, we can't do that. Even breath, just as how I track my uh, breathing, different type of breathing, well, these people will experience the same at different times. That is how we take the uh, bahidda part, external part. Just a, uh, I would say, a common understanding about other people go, th go through the same uh, experiences, bodily, feeling-wise, uh, mind-wise, and then dhamma-wise. Yeah. Mm, thanks for that clarification. So uh, the way you're, you're describing it, Bhante, sounds like, like a practice of empathy, mm. right? Beginning to sort of... Um, Understand it, it, the it, other's it, perspective. It has empathy. It has empathy. But be careful. Em, uh, empathy is the shorter version of compassion. Empathy means that you are trying to put you in other people's shoes. But uh, what do you call... Um, uh, then that takes you to a different practice. While Kind of. It has the nature of empathy. Yes. It has the nature. But... But you know where you have to take you, because it is not only other people. Oneself, other people, you have to look at uh, the changes of your, uh, this particular Satipatthana. Other things have to be practiced too. This is only one thing. If you go to Satipatthana's translation, you will see that. Yeah. Mm. 
I, I, I don't know if this is a far-fetched suggestion. I was thinking something like a practice of mindful conversation because I have, I have, uh, I've been on a meditation retreat before where there was a segment on, on practicing mindful conversation mm -hmm. where uh, we are instructed to be mindful of our own body and feelings as well as also pay attention to the context, the surrounding, and also some of the, maybe the body language of the other person as well. And uh, we, we might not need to, so to speak, interrogate them on every feeling they have, but maybe generally inquiring into their general state of mind could be a way to understand them better in terms of their feelings or their emotions. I'm not sure if that is a helpful way, like this, this practice of mindful conversation or, or, or dialogue could be one way or one option to, to practice that part of the instruction, the externally part of the instruction. Is it, is it possible that this might facilitate a, a better understanding of others as well? Then again, we have to go to all the people, some kind of people. But here it says a universalized uh, knowledge about other people. We may only talk to certain kind of our circles. We don't know what other people think, other than what, who we know. Uh, th that takes you to another uh, level of con uh, another level of dhamma practice. That means mitabani, how to talk to other people, right? Uh, that's a different topic. So here, what you need to understand is, you already know how people go through different things. We we always have a certain, by far, we have a certain, uh, I would say, an understanding how people go through breathing, how people go through um, postures. Some people can walk well, some people cannot. So we just take that knowledge, maybe with some experiences, uh, to cover this, to practice this bahidda part. Uh, but when you talk to other certain kind of people, you may come up with some certain uh, insights about their practices. Uh, it is not very much necessary for bahidda, but it, is, it will be helpful too. And you will get to know. Uh, this person has different ways of thinking, using different words, approaches, yeah. But it's not highly necessary for the practice here. Yes, thank okay. you, Bhante. Okay. Okay. Maybe uh, uh, and uh, follow up from there is uh, maybe if I try to understand and paraphrase what Bhante is mentioning is that the purpose of you uh, telling us to look at it from this perspective is to remove the selfishness aspect. That's the point. That's uh, the point. Which means that is why I wanted to show. Because in our, in in my own practice as well, we find that a lot of time as we start to do, the the doing part of the meditation is still there very strongly. So it, it identifies very selfish behaviors. Yeah. And what you mentioned is that yeah, if I can take it as a lot more. In general, there is breathing that yeah. happening. In general, there is feelings, and I remove myself out of that mm -hmm. that thing to re, to be less self centered in the yes. practice. Is yeah. if that if that's what Bhante is yes is, universalizing uh, universalizing the experiences of uh, body uh, feelings thoughts and uh, I would say dhamma things dhamma properties. So that's it. That is how we had to. But in our Usual sila practice, yes, we talk to other people, we try to talk nicely, softly, gently, uh, without hurting them. That is another uh, way, that is to, about the sila part. Yeah, this is about the mindfulness. Yes. Yeah, good evening, Bhante. Good evening. Yeah, um, um, do you have today's topic about, about the <coughs> meditation and the selfiness? Mm -hmm. huh? uh, I have a question because you look at the Theravada and Mahayana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you practice meditation, if you are in the Theravada school and you are in a Mahayana school, you are thinking you have small vehicles and big vehicles. So, uh, to me, it's more like a Mahayana mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there any difference between the Theravada or Mahayana when it comes to meditation? We are our, our teacher, both our teacher, the school, our teacher is a Buddha. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is Buddha Theravada or Mahayana? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Answer that question. Yeah, yes. I, because All these are later stuff. Later on, uh, how many schools died, died out? Yes. How many schools died out? Sarvastivada died out. Uh, the Northern Afghanistan, what you call Gandharas one, Dhammaguptikas, they died out. They are very famous Vinaya schools. They died out because those schools cannot survive with their ideology. Then Theravada was existed. 
and maybe some of the Mahayana schools existed. So now, do we have to look at Buddhism only from them? I don't think so. Even the early Buddhism is not, we, do, we see the fundamental, we are thankful to them. But I think, I like your way, you know, you go to Mahayana temple, chant, and you come to the Theravada temple, or Pradhana, it's good, really nice. If you go to Thailand, no, it's not. Sri Lanka, it's not. Burma, it's not. They, they choose to go to Theravada temple. They choose to go to uh, this and that. So, to me, we have no sect. But when you want to become a monk, yes, you have to go to, if you go to, uh, go to a Theravada monk, you have to take it from the Theravada temple. That is what we are left with now. But you are going to be a follower of the Buddha. The Buddha has no sects. No Theravada, no Maha, no Vadrayana. So we are actually non-sectarian. We are non-sectarian, we should be. But we cannot easily let go of the legacy too. It is a challenge, right? Because we know how, the, how these things come down to us. Now he of course our great uh, chief monk, right? So we, we cannot easily let go of these people. Because that is how we are inherited all these things. But if you really understand Buddhism, we have no problem with Theravada Mahayana. And actually I don't like that translation too. Small vehicle, great, big vehicle. What vehicle is that? <laughs> we, we have only one thing. Attain Nibbana. If you want to take a chance, you go become a Buddha. Actually I like that. Becoming a Buddha is the best way. Uh, that idea we have to take from Mahayana. They say everybody is a Bodhisattva. You all are Bodhisattvas. So, uh, Theravada has a different approach, but you have to combine all them together. So, to me, uh, I think you shouldn't make it a problem unless you go to these temples, you take whatever the things you want to practice, and you blend your own practice. Who is asking what is your practice? Right? Blend that practice. Take whatever the good things from Mahayana, take from uh, Theravada, and then you make your practice. And do not get stuck in any of these, even Vajrayana or whatever practices. So, to me, I am a Buddhist of everybody. Uh, that is how we have to see. But if you ask me from the contemporary view, yes, there is something like a challenge, but it is not going to be a serious challenge too, because nobody is going to push me, hey, you have to only become a Theravada. It is a personal, mental kind of a thing. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. That is how we have to think. Yeah, yeah, that's why I want to relate to another thing. So when Buddha say the first, the what I call the Buddha talk about the four noble truths, mm. then the continue with the noble eightfold path, and then if we really study the noble eightfold path, mm -hmm. then what well, then is the right mindfulness, yeah, right mindfulness. Then you need to you need to really you know uh, understanding the all the seven eightfold path plus in mindfulness, mm -hmm. then will help you in meditation. In other words. Is that simply to say that when you practice meditation, you are not going to be selfish because you have right, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Very true. Yeah. So, but what is the problem here? Why, why it has become a selfish practice to some people? Because the current contemporary mindfulness movement that wherever you go, they only take out one out of that path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They only promote it without telling the rest of the seven. Uh, that is why, what I am addressing over here. Otherwise, textually, there is no conflict. They all agree. Yeah, textually, you cannot start meditation without samaditi, right view. Samma sankappa, samma vacha, samma. So, I had to go in order and then come to the samma sati. Textually, no problem, but how things are being practiced is the problem by some people, not everybody. Yeah? So, I had to disclaim. <laughs> Maybe most of the people. Because Vipassana movement was normally, it was started as a, as a, we don't find Vipassana in the main early Buddhist text. Buddha never says, go do Vipassana. We don't find it. Uh, he says, uh, practice the Noble Eightfold Path. So the word Vipassana has been taken separately because it was a kind of a movement made by Burmese monks to colonialism at that time in, in Myanmar. The British, I would say Europeans, uh, they were trying to say that we have roots so we can actually fight back. It has become a big tradition after that. 
sad, uh, you know, sadhus and all that. It's good in a way, but in early Buddhist text, Buddha says, noble eightfold part, not only meditation, samaditi, sammasankappa, sammavacha, all together. But when you take out that as an answer to the uh, uh, colonialism, it was only taken out. That was the issue. Yes. All right, so we'll take only one more question if you have, otherwise we're going to transfer the merits. Good evening, Vante. Yes, good evening. Yes, um, my question is perhaps more in a conventional sense, right? Um, selfishness in a conventional sense. Because I guess as we begin our Dhamma journey, um, and as we attempt to walk the Noble Eightfold Path as, as um, you know, uh, faithfully as possible, with right understanding, of course, um, we might tend to distance ourselves from certain mm. company and uh, certain people, even certain ideas that we used to hold on to. So uh, that itself, at a conventional level, may seem to be a selfish thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the self that leads to the end of self. Mm -hmm. But um, how do we reconcile that, perhaps, um, you know, um, that act of wisdom to distance ourselves from other people, to associate less with certain people, uh, in order to progress ourselves spiritually? Read those methodologies at the end of each Satipatthana. That is what I read. Huh? If you read the uh, final uh, section of each Satipatthana, it clearly says this practice you have to do with oneself and others. It clearly says. If you know that, then uh, you won't distance people. Because uh, conventionally you distance, because there is a larger, broader understanding that you have to distance to become a better person in some uh, schools, maybe there are some promotions like that. But if you really, if you ask me how to, how to avoid that distancing, you understand it's a problem. Because people do not know the methodology of each Satipatthana. If you know it, then you will do it as a self-practice and also as a practice of being concerned about other people too. But sometimes, um, perhaps certain sense restraints or literal physical distancing, like let's say if you used to, um, uh, friend groups is a very good example, at least mm -hmm. in the modern age, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have to admit that some friend groups are very toxic or uh, perhaps does not um, encourage you to, to do a lot of wholesome uh, actions. Or, you know, even in the Mita Sutta, it, uh, Patama and, and Dutia, there were mm -hmm. all these conditions, right, or, or mm -hmm. criteria of a good friend. So mm -hmm. in a case where you do not meet friends like this, or perhaps your friends have, um, are, are not like this, so we have to kind of be more, in a way, selfish and part ways. Mm -hmm. Well, so. we do not blame the society, right? Now in the same temple, Buddha had the enemy, Devadatta. He had the uh, arch enemy. And he took 500 monks to the Gaya, when the Buddha was in the temple. He was in the temple. He took 500 monks. They believed him, than the Buddha. Because he said, I am going to avoid eating meat, flesh. You cannot eat food in the temple. Go on Pindapatha. You cannot wear normal uh, ropes, make uh, ropes from the dead bodies. And so on and so forth. They thought, oh, extreme, good sila. Huh? Buddha is not that <laughs> sila. So they were persuaded. And at the time, um, Buddha spent one of his vasas in a temple in Kosambi. Uh, monks were broken into two groups, Dhamma and Vinaya. And then they started quarreling each other. Buddha said, don't do this. They did not listen to him. So he left the temple. So in my understanding, uh, people who don't agree with us, people who you said as toxic, they are everywhere. I don't think we should make it a problem. Because in Buddhism, we cannot distance anybody. Because we have to practice unconditional metta. So we still say, hi, bye, how are you, what are you doing? But we know the level, we're going to take them into intimacy or not. That is we, something that we have to manage. So uh, if you think that there are toxic circles, of course you have a, you can have a choice to make about them. Uh, whether I take them into my intimacy, to uh, so much uh, closer to me or not. And also you have a choice to make on good people, kalyanamitas, sappurisas, good friends. So I think when we have choices, we're going to make uh, 
to help our Dhamma journey go on. At the same time, for the people who you think toxic, you still treat them as normal human beings. We cannot, we cannot just do anything wrong to them. So that is how we're going to manage these two groups and then uh, go on our Dhamma journey. In Buddhism, we never blame anybody. Good people, bad people, we just say hi and bye to all. Like a good person. If there's a good person, he knows how to handle everybody in a company. Lazy people, uh, bad people, he knows how to do it, she knows how to do it. But if you are so much perfectionist, you can't do that. Oh, you are a bad person, don't come to me. You can't do it. You have to be smart. Right? Maybe if you are a lazy person, that person is a very well, uh, good ent entrepreneur, so I can't work with him or her. I think some smartness. You need some smartness. I will tell you one small story to uh, finish that uh, uh, answer. Uh, in one of the, I think, stories in the text, it says one big cobra wanted to pre uh, take precepts, five precepts. So he went up to a hermitage. At that time, animals uh, are said to speak. Huh? I don't know how. <laughs> and then he said to the uh, sage over there, ascetic, uh, Reverend Sir, I want to take precepts. He said, How come? You are biting people, every being. He said, No, no, no. I will take an extra effort. I'm going to be a virtuous animal, good being. Okay. Then he gave the five precepts. Not killing, not stealing, not misbehaving, not lying, not uh, having intoxications. Then on the same day he was uh, going somewhere, the snake, and then somebody was making a firewood. He was stacking the firewood. Unfortunately, he was just moving around, then he made the stack with him inside. Now he cannot do anything, he cannot make sound, he cannot hiss, because then something can happen, he might, he might do something, right? Snake. Then he was taken to the house, now he saw something strange in the st stack of the firewood, he saw some, a snake was stuck in there. He then he, he carefully uh, picked up a, a stick and then tried to do something, but the snake didn't do anything, thinking, oh maybe a very non-harmful -harm rattlesnake. And then he, with so much pain, <laughs> he was able to leave the place. And then uh, in the evening, he went to the temple again, that particular hermitage. Then uh, from afar, the hermit asked, the sage asked, Ah, how's your practice of sila today? See what happened to me. <laughs> I've been practicing sila. I was so much painful now. He explained everything. Then what he said, I did not ask you to defend in a proper way. You are not supposed to bite anybody, but you could have shown that you can bite. If you had done it, he would not have put you into the firewood. Sometimes when you are so kind, so good, other people trying to huh? take you for granted. I think we have a talk about it in other talks. I'll save the stuff for that. So I think we have choices. We can make choices. Let's make choices. The only thing is we have to be smart. Don't take black and white. Bad people, good people. If you take like that way, then you don't see the grey area. Ah, that's the thing. That is the answer. Thank you very much, Vanti. Right. All right. I hope the time has up, been up, right? Thank, thank okay. you, Vanti, for sharing.